My name is Tom Daly. I'm the education curator for the museum. I have the opportunity, uh, luckily, to celebrate many of Rockwell's works. And today we're going to be celebrating not the paintings, though we will be talking about them. Uh, we'll be celebrating the anniversary of the speech itself. In the future days, if we seek to make the cure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. If we think back to uh, December 17th, 1940, what was happening on that day? The idea of isolationism is very, very palatable to most Americans at that point. Um, the thought that we would get involved in another world war after the war to end all wars was pretty tough to even imagine um, by most people's standards. Uh, we also, uh, as a country, wanted to try and build up a little bit of our resources after, of course, the Great Depression um, really made it difficult for people to make a living, uh, even have enough food to live. And so this idea of separating our resources again would be pretty difficult. But December 17th, 1940, President Roosevelt brings forward this idea of the Lend Lease Act. We're going to offer this opportunity that if you need war equipment, especially Great Britain, that we're not, we can't give it to you, but we could lend or lease it to you. And the, pay, the payments might come due in 2016. Who knows? It wasn't a push to get the money. What the push was to try and make sure that England felt supported in the war. Uh, after all, of course, they're still dealing with, uh, with the aftermath of World War I and the economic depression during the 30s as well. So um, they really need someone to make sure that they can feel bolstered. They're right on, literally on the front lines. So this is Roosevelt's plan. He's going to offer anyone who has a democratic nation the opportunity to have access to equipment they need to fight this European war. And the bulk of what we now call the Four Freedoms speech was really more about Lend-Lease. So saying, you know what, we can really help these folks that are in these dire straits. England is, is you know, one of our partners here and we really have to find a way to help. So Roosevelt, in um, kind of a little bit of a, a stroke of genius, realizes that if he finds something that people could really latch on to, um, then that might be enough to sell the idea of this war to the American people. So in the last uh, four, three and a half minutes of the speech, which lasted about 36 minutes, um, he mentions the four freedoms. This is a, a photograph that represents Roosevelt delivering this speech. And as you heard me say upstairs, this was not the State of the Union address. It's often talked about in that way, but the reality is there would be no such thing as a State of the Union address until 1942. So this was just the President's obligation to explain to Congress what's been going on and what might be coming up, something that a President is required to do and really up until the 20th century, was primarily done with a letter. The, pre the president would write up the idea and then send it to Congress, and that would pretty much be it. Um, and the, the, that process started actually with a guy named Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson had a little bit of stage fright. He was paralyzed uh, as far as speaking in front of people. So instead of doing what the other couple of presidents had done, he sent the letter, and that started that long line of folks just sending a written account of what might be happening. So Roosevelt, certainly in his element, he really enjoyed public speaking. He was very good at it, very well trained at public speaking, of course. His one, you might say, shortcoming <coughs> was that he tended to speak in a higher form of language than most people would. Um, and the ideas that he brought forward tended to be ideas that were a little higher than the average citizen might be able to latch on to right away. So here's a typewritten uh, segment of the speech right here. All these documents, you can access all these documents online thanks to the FDR library. And to me, the key to all four of these statements is that Roosevelt's not saying, hey, you and I are going to get our freedoms and the rest of them, well, whatever. 
He's saying, as Americans, if we back this idea, everyone in the world will have access to these freedoms. So we have students here, we always like to ask them, how, how'd we do so far? 75 years later, everybody have these freedoms? No. no. And we like to ask them, you know, how about in our country? No. How about state? And we just sort of went it down, right down to their school district or their town. And uh, kids are very aware, kids especially today, are really aware of the fact that others don't have these basic freedoms. Even their neighbors don't have some of these basic freedoms. The speech, everybody, you know, kind of likes to pop on the rose-colored glasses and say, oh, the Fort Freedom speech, boy, that really knocked it out of the park. Not really. Here's the highlights of the message right here. On page six, <laughs> speech was a little bit of a flop because Roosevelt wasn't telling people necessarily what they wanted to hear. What I'm sure many people would, would have wanted to hear was, don't worry, we're not going to get involved in the war at all. I'm out. You know, that's pretty much all they were kind of hoping to hear. But Roosevelt, of course, realizes that there's more to what's going on in Europe than just a war between a couple of countries in Europe. He realizes that there will be, in, in my uh, estimation, that there will be a uh, world war. And this is Ralph uh, Fabry's version of the Four Freedoms. The war bond shows that were um, around the country, and what would happen is that the paintings that you saw upstairs, those traveled around the country, um, and the, there was a freedom train, and each painting had its own car, and they would have other artwork in there as well. Uh, some of the war bond drives and the shows they would have maybe in a large theater in a town, and you get a chance to meet Norman Rockwell and maybe Betty Grable. You know, you'd have this opportunity to meet a star and to meet the, the illustrator, all with the idea that if you contributed some money to this effort, you'd get a poster, uh, you'd have a chance, as I said, to meet a celebrity. Um, the, there are even Four Freedoms stamps, the uh, penny post stamps that uh, related to the Four Freedoms. And uh, then Roosevelt got one of his own, and they added the Four Freedoms as part of that. So it ended up being a little bit more to it than Roosevelt even had imagined. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Freedoms are drawn um, on by the Library Association, FDR, of course. He, uh, his words end up being made into posters. And what the federal government realizes is that these ideas are something that people can get behind. So instead of pushing this idea that we're going to send ships and tanks and all that stuff to England, the government refocuses. Because after all, these images that Rockwell did have been in the, in the Saturday Evening Post, and they're starting to garner a lot of interest. And they start to realize that, well, wait a second, we can get people looking at these pictures thinking about the idea that Americans want to protect freedom for people, and that might be enough to help people get behind the war effort. Now, Roosevelt showed up in a lot of places during the 1940s. Um, here's one of the spots. He had some help from this guy right here. Super, Superman. He was in comics uh, throughout. You can see even uh, referenced here during the 39 World's Fair. So uh, Roosevelt was calling on anyone he could imagine to try and help him with the upcoming war. So you might recognize a few of those folks in the copy of that comic book over there, Captain America, who was a new invention right around this time. Um, all of you recognize this guy right up here with the rats and the snakes scurrying away from him. That's how bad a person he was. And then there's Roosevelt. Now, if you were a little kid buying comic books or even an adult buying comic books, you could not buy this comic book. The government printed the comic book, airdropped it over Japan and even into Germany. And what the comic book was meant to do was to show you how strong FDR was. There are airplanes and there's tanks and guns and all that stuff. And as you flip through that comic book, which had no words, it showed you visually how strong and how dominant that this country and this man was. So these folks right here, they have to have a place to live. And here's that place, Four Freedoms Plaza. 
They even published an address for Four Freedoms Plaza. It was in New York City, but it was constructed out of materials that you couldn't see with the naked eye. So you might just walk right past it and not realize you'd been past the Four Freedoms Plaza. What we see in American culture at this time is that the idea of the visual image is becoming very, very important. And people aren't reading as much. Maybe they don't have time. Maybe television has sort of started to creep in a little bit here and there. Radio is certainly taking their interest. A magazine called the Saturday Evening Post has garnered a lot of interest as well. So we're seeing a lot of people turn to visual. The other folks that are looking at visual information are the folks in the military. And finding out there's a Fantastic Four is trying to help you as uh, somebody in the military. The idea of the Four Freedoms uh, did uh, spread across the country. Uh, here we are in Evansville, Indiana. That was their train station. The train station was taken down. But the town, Evansville, for some reason, felt that they would hold on to those columns. And what they ended up doing with those columns, as you can see from the photograph on the foreground, is that they made a Four Freedoms memorial out of them. The idea of the Four Freedoms being uh, centra centralized to, to the Northeast um, is a little bit of a misnomer. Here they are in a parking lot in California. And behind that wall is a hardware store. But the town felt so. Um, so impressed by what Rockwell had done and what Roosevelt had talked about that on the 50th anniversary, these were painted. There are also memorials in other parts of the country and in other parts of the world. This one right here is in the Netherlands. <coughs> the, um, the Dutch people and, uh, and we have sort of joined together in this idea of the four freedoms. So every other year, um, whether it's in the Netherlands or the United States, they celebrate Four Freedoms recipients. So in America, when the um, awards are done, and they're usually done uh, down in Hyde Park, uh, an American who's exemplified one of these freedoms is given an award. When they're uh, in Europe, the awards uh, tend to be somebody who's more international, who's worked to, to forward the idea of freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. Uh, illustrator's view of what the Four Freedoms could have looked like. Troy, Michigan, um, they have a very large sculpture out there, again, representing the Four Freedoms. And this one over here is kind of an important uh, sculpture. It had a different home. It used to live in New York City. But after the first casualty in World War II, it was moved to Madison, Florida, because that's where the young man was from who was killed. Today, we're seeing it referenced in stone in Washington, D.C. We see the Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island in New York City. They're doing events today as well um, to commemorate the anniversary of the speech. Four Freedoms flag. It was used during the war bond shows. They would have it. It would be part of the decoration of the area. They'd put that flag out. Um, if you were a real patriotic person, very interested in the Four Freedoms, you might put one out on your flagpole. And what the, you know, the, the government, they resisted the idea of Rockwell doing these images. They weren't that interested in um, Norman Rockwell showing how these four freedoms could intersect with our everyday lives. They thought maybe there's another artist out there that could do a better job or do it more interesting way. They finally came around after these images were printed in the Saturday Evening Post along with essays, Booth, Tarkington and the like, wrote essays about each of these freedoms. So the idea of the four freedoms is something that's coming back again to the government. They say, OK, yeah, well, let's see. Maybe we could get those posters. Maybe we could use these ideas to show people that these high ideals are something that we all have benefited from, this opportunity to have some level of these freedoms. This uh, small poster would have been seen in, um, in schools, in um, post offices, uh, in federal buildings. And as you can see, now we've boiled down that speech to just these few lines. And uh, Rockwell, of course, um, continues to show his patriotism by showing images that um, remind us that the guys are enjoying themselves a little bit in Fort Dix while they're getting trained. A number of different uh, uh, branches of the service were being trained there. And Rosie the Riveter. So Rockwell's showing how the entire country is supporting this effort. These were, this was done in 1943, the same year the Four Freedoms appeared inside the Saturday Evening Post. Half a year later, uh, the Liberty Girl would show up too. So she shows uh, many of the different jobs that women did during World War II. And you can see those in our um, Saturday Evening Post exhibition.
And during this time period, when women are working in these factories, building airplanes, tanks, testing the viscosity of fluid, um, most of these women had about two weeks training. And I'll match that up. Men, when they were working in these same factories, tended to have to apprentice for about a year in order to do the same work. Women in the Grumman plant set a record for assembling an airplane that was never broken. The women had to make sure they did a great job putting these planes together because who was going to be flying these planes from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, all the way over to England? They're going to, they're, they're, no, they're the women. Women are going to be flying. They're not going to waste Ted Williams flying an airplane just to England. No, you're going to send, oh, get, get a woman to come on and fly that plane, that hop over the ocean, and then she can find a way back, however that works out. Women had a much larger role than we might imagine during this time period. And, and Rockwell took a lot of efforts to make sure that we could see that women did um, contribute a lot. Anybody notice the copy of the book that she has her feet on? Copy of Mein Kampf. She's very confidently resting her feet on that book. Rockwell's not one to miss a trick, that's for sure. This is a study of freedom of speech, which is in the Met uh, Metropolitan Museum. Uh, suddenly, I remembered how Jim Edgerton had stood up in the town meeting. So Rockwell was talking a little bit about how he was inspired to paint freedom of speech. He said something that everybody disagreed with. But then they let him have his say. No one shouted him down. My gosh, I thought, there it is, freedom of speech. Rockwell's not watching a movie tone news and getting inspired by this. He's watching his new neighbors. He's moved up to Arlington, Vermont in 1939 full time. He's starting to go to a town meeting. The guy grew up in New York City, had no idea what a town meeting was, no, no idea what would happen there. But what he saw was a very pure form of not only f the freedom of speech, but democracy too. He saw that you and I could disagree, but still be in the same room together, still shop at the one store that's in town, still go to the quality restaurant at the same time and not have to make an, a battle out of it. And that was the thing that impressed Rockwell about his neighbors. So that's what helped him create this image. And then you can see Mr. Rockwell himself is right there this is the only one of the four freedoms where Mr. Rockwell himself appears. You notice that the man standing up is an ordinary guy with a zipper shirt and a suede jacket that's pretty dirty and rough. His hands are a little gnarled. And then you notice his booklet, his annual report, has been accessed. He's opened that annual report. He's looked through and said, oh, I want to talk about this. Folded the report up, put it in his pocket. He's been motivated by whatever the topic was to go there and express his opinion. And what Rockwell's really done, I think, a, a wonderful job with is he's shown that all these people are respecting that man as he addresses the group. Rockwell also enlarged a couple of ears here and there to let you know that people are listening. Well, the idea of the freedom is really um, caught hold very quickly, as we talked about just a moment ago. And this is actually a bookseller's window in the middle of New York City. They made this collage to give people a sense of the role that books were playing in, uh, in the war. A pile of books burning here, another pile of books burning over there, and a, just a reminder of what was happening to challenge this idea of freedom of speech. So we play a game with the school kids that, that come here and we show them this image and we say, which one of the four freedoms is this a study for? So the people who are gonna get the right to worship are middle-aged men who are white. Well, that's a stretch, right? So what Rockwell does is changes that. Notice how Rockwell has used uh, what we would call a monochromatic palette to draw all these disparate people together, right? Old, young, male, female, black, white. Um, as detailed a tapestry as Rockwell thought he might be able to get away with, um, with this image. And a rare uh, opportunity that Rockwell took to put some lettering on a painting. He tended not to do that wasn't very crazy about lettering. This lady right here, her name is Rose Hoyt. And Rose was a very good friend of mine. She lived in Arlington, Vermont. And um, she would send me updates, uh, unfortunate updates when the models would pass. She would write me a card, ask how I was doing, how things were going here. And then at the end of the card, she would mention uh, this and so person passed away. And uh, it was the saddest day when I received uh, a letter from 
her, um, one of her friends, and unfortunately it was Rose's obituary, and that was about six years ago. Ration books, a, a piece of history that I always feel is almost getting lost in sort of the, the amalgamation of history. This idea that in the United States, if you had money and you wanted to buy Hamburg, you couldn't do it unless you had your coupon. Couldn't buy shoes, couldn't buy tires, couldn't buy gasoline unless you had the right sticker on your window, right? This idea that we're trying to save. I, I often sort of wonder what this would be like if this happened today, this idea of rationing, you know. And I'm not naive enough to think that there wasn't a black market for product that was available here and there. Um, but for the ordinary person, the, the, just the struggle to say, I don't have enough gas to get to see my parents or get to see my children, or enough coupons to buy steak that week for 14 cents a pound. And then you see Rockwell's take on freedom from want. Right? We have everything that we need, more than what we need. We have companionship galore here. Rockwell's mom, his wife Mary across the way. James Martin again looking out at us. Sometimes I like to tell our third graders, he's watching so don't misbehave. <laughs> so James Martin, of course, is inviting us in. So we'll have that opportunity to enjoy all of this bounty that's here and not just the food. Again, you have shelter, uh, something to drink, and the companionship I talked about before. So Rockwell was uh, very good to make sure that we all felt included. So included that um, about three or four years ago on Modern Family, that uh, sitcom that's on television, they did an entire episode that revolved around this one picture. Uh, and then the final of the four freedoms, of course, is this one, freedom from fear. This idea that we would need to think about having a world that was free from fear in our own everyday lives was a distance away for many, many people, freedom from fear. And uh, of course, the events of uh, some 15 years ago changed that dramatically for everyone, uh, so dramatically that a couple of days after 9-11 happened, we still had people coming here to sit in that gallery and look at that painting. Um, and unfortunately, it's become a painting that people are very familiar with. Uh, Rockwell does a great job here again of putting us in that room. Um, you notice the doll on the floor here, right? Left aside as the little girl is asleep, so she's not afraid when she goes to sleep. Um, we also notice the newspaper to let us know there is fear somewhere, but not in this room, right? Everybody's together, maybe mom and dad, brother and sister, and if that's not enough, up here in the corner, you can see an image that looks a little bit like a guardian angel looking over the family. The warm light coming upstairs uh, helps us feel even more secure in uh, the image. Uh, Rockwell was uh, really good about making sure that these images could tell these stories very, very completely. Because after all, Roosevelt wasn't an ordinary guy you want to chit-chat with. Probably a, a very nice man, very intelligent guy, but had a, probably a tough time kind of getting uh, getting to understand what a meat and potatoes person might actually, get under, might actually deal with. After all, his cousin was a president of the United States, or his wife's cousin, I guess, technically. Here's Rockwell's response to a very traumatic moment during his own lifetime. This is when Norman Rockwell's studio burnt to the ground, the year 1943. So luckily, the Four Freedoms weren't involved in this, in this fire. This is his studio in Arlington. Rockwell uh, called the fire department, unfortunately had a little trouble getting a hold of them because the phone went from the, from the studio to the house. The studio, as I said, was a total loss. They managed to save the bicycles, and the running joke in New England always is, and the cellar hole. So this I find kind of interesting. Some of you might recognize a few of those names, like Oscar Levant there. Uh, you might even remember, you might even notice uh, Aaron Copeland's name, Gershwin. Um, this is a piece of music that was created called The Four Freedoms, a symphony after Four Freedoms paintings by Norman Rockwell. Now the paintings have overshadowed, uh, if you will, that speech. And you know we're only looking here at a couple of years after the, uh, the speech was delivered. And here are the war bond shows we mentioned earlier with celebrities um, that you could meet. Norman Rockwell, there he is right there. Um, you had. Uh, wives of uh, Treasury Department heads and 
uh, different cabinet members that might show up and they would uh, do a rousing speech and you have a, a space that we cordoned off a little bit like a gallery. You might see Rosie the Riveter, you might see some of uh, the Willie Gillis images that they would travel. Uh, we all have our own quests in our job. I'd love to find out who that little kid is. Uh, I just think that's, well, what presence? Hey, there's a camera. Um, and of course, there's Mr. Rockwell right there signing one of the smaller versions of the War Bonds posters. Um, this is a question, basically ABC is wondering which of the paintings that Rockwell created were his favorites. A very popular question for Mr. Rockwell when he was on television with Jack Parr, he was asked that question as well. Rockwell wasn't great with, with deadlines either. He tended to be late on almost everything. So they're sort of pushing him. We really would appreciate hearing from you as soon as possible. We have to go on the air. And uh, here's Rockwell's hand, uh, handwriting. And uh, what he says is that um, the Four Freedoms were his favorite works at that point. Rockwell had hoped for some help with these paintings. Um, it wasn't a guy that tended to go out and ask people for help. But his sincere hope was that Michelangelo would come back from the dead to help him with these pictures. You would see these ads, this one happens to be in the Saturday Evening Post, um, talking about the importance of the four freedoms. And then the war bonds posters along the bottom. Very debonair for the late 70s there with his, with his ascot on and his pipe, uh, his plaid jacket. Uh, you know, Mr. Rockwell continued to paint right up to uh, near the end of his life. Well, these two pictures, I see them um, as sort of being part of one another in a way, done about 20 years apart. And I used to like to tease Rose because here she is in 1943, published date, and here she is in 1961. Some of you might have noticed the golden rule in the news in the last few months. Um, we loaned it to the United Nations. The United Nations was celebrating their 70th anniversary. And uh, it is appropriate to talk about the United Nations, of course, because Roosevelt's connection to the United Nations through his wife, uh, making sure that those things happen. Uh, when Nancy Reagan's husband was in office, she was so interested in this image, she actually had, she and a group of ladies from Texas actually got together and had a large mosaic um, created of the Golden Rule. And they had that installed on the third floor of the United Nations building. So we offered, we thought that would be a nice thing for them to have that there for the 70th. They accepted it, which we were very excited about. And it ended up hanging around a few days after they were done with their exhibition um, because the Pope was coming into town and um, they uh, gave the Pope an opportunity to see this painting. Rockwell started working with the Post in 1916, a hundred years ago, today, really a hundred years ago. You were used to seeing these images on that magazine, sort of telling you what was going on in culture. All of a sudden, in the early 1960s, thanks to Molly, his third wife, you start to see him showing these ideas of the civil rights movement, which he felt very strongly about. As a matter of fact, Mary, Norman Rockwell's second wife, is right up here in the corner of the painting, embracing what would have been her first grand, would have been their first, first grandchild, Jeffrey. Um, unfortunately, Mary died before Jeffrey was born. So Rockwell was able to bring them together in the painting. So today, what we see are the Four Freedoms Park I talked about earlier. There's their identifying image. You know, museums like to have identifying images. They use a blue striped flag, if you will, to echo the red flag we talked about earlier. And here's one of the greatest places to visit if you have an opportunity. And, and take a look at the interior of what the Oval Office looked like when Roosevelt was in there. They did a mock-up of it. It's fantastic celebrating the anniversaries because this year we can celebrate the anniversary of the speech. In a couple of years, we can celebrate the 75th anniversary of the paintings. Um, and I'll just leave you this last image of Mr. Rockwell. Um, he was in Los Angeles. That's where this exhibition was. And um, this was, went along with an article that talked about how Mr. Rockwell felt that times were changing and it was about time that people started to get up with the times and started to realize that freedom was something for everybody.